Hey, good morning and welcome. My name is Brenda Muller and I help business professionals and job seekers get a bigger slice of the LinkedIn pie. And today you're joining me for a LinkedIn Live episode with Kelsey Claus. Hey, Kelsey, how are you doing today? Hey, Brenda, I'm great. So happy to be here. I love your LinkedIn Live. So very excited to be here today. Well, I am delighted to have you. And I want to tell our audience, I'm going to pull back the curtain a little bit and just talk about what happened in the pre-show. So yesterday, my computer, my laptop was acting up a little bit. And I thought I'd just been doing too many videos and too much stuff. So I shut it down completely for the night. I turned it on um, a little while ago, maybe about 20 minutes ago, and it was making these really loud noises, like the fan was running really loud. And then it was going really slow and laggy. And I realized I'm going to probably have to put my laptop in timeout and use a different laptop. <laughs> in the meantime, I'm trying to get ready. I've got you coming on. And I, I'm like, I am a professional. I will handle this. We will make its way through. And I always tell my uh, my listeners, Kelsey, I'm like, I don't make mistakes. I have learning experience. And I don't even know if this would qualify exactly. as a mistake. It's just a tech hiccup. Sometimes it wouldn't be a true die. live show without something like this happening. I, absolutely. And I'm like, you're a PR professional. So you get it. You, you got to think on your feet. And I always like to tell people what's what's happening and then pivot. To, to, like, the show must go on, so to speak. So exactly. <laughs> there we have it. <laughs> So I want to just welcome those of you who are watching on LinkedIn right now. If you could, please drop a comment below. Let us know that you are watching. This is especially important right now because my second screen isn't up. So I'm not sure if the broadcast is on LinkedIn. So help a sister out here. Go in comments and just say hello, good morning, or yes, it's working, something to that effect. I pushed a stream out from StreamYard to LinkedIn, and we're, and we're now on Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. So I'm hoping one person will see it on at least one of those networks and drop a comment. And Kelsey, I always tell people that's kind of like the mic tap. If we were on a, on a stage at an event, it would be Absolutely. like us tapping the mic and, and somebody in the back saying, yep, the microphones are working and you're good to go. So Definitely. I'll rely on, I see some people saying hi. So thank you, yeah. Randy. Hi, Randy. Uh, I, I see someone here, Steven saying, got me a link. All right, thank you guys. Thanks, <laughs> I'm like, this, this isn't going to phase me. This is just another challenge to get through a little bit of an adrenaline rush that I didn't plan on for the morning. But at any rate, Kelsey, you Better and I, uh, we've though. been connected for a little while on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. And I think you're on my VIP email list. Does that sound right too? Yes, exactly. Okay. And you responded to my inquiry and I said, I'm, I'm, I'm relaunching my show um, in the past, it was just LinkedIn Live, social media pie, and it was more of a, a general, really great speakers coming on. But this this year, I decided to focus on individuals who help coaches, consultants, speakers, and authors. So I really got more niche focus in there. And I and I put some instructions out there, and I said, "Hey, if you want to come in and join me, here's what you need to do." And I gave very, and they were pretty easy. I'm like, send me an email that says, pick me, pick me. And, and there was a couple other things I said, like, follow my show. And, and there's a couple, and it was pretty simple to do, but you were like the one person who did it, you know, <laughs> and, and you were so kind because you reached out to me at the point in time where I had started booking shows in January and I was doing every week on Tuesday. And I got mm -hmm. to the point where I'm like, well, the summer is going to be coming up. I don't know what I want to do. I might want to take a hi hiatus for the summer. Yeah. I launched the podcast. I'm converting things over. And you reached out and I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to do yet, but could you just hang out for a little bit? And you're like, yes, that's fine. Absolutely. And then I, and then I think you reached out to me very politely and you checked in and I said, you know what? I think I'm going to do some shows in the summer. I'm going to do like every other week and you're going to be like the first one that we're going to do. So um, I brought you on and, and here we are today and we're going to be talking about three tips for securing high impact PR for your business. Now, Kelsey, for people who don't know you, could you take a few minutes and tell us a little bit about who you are? who you help and what do you do? Absolutely. Well, thanks again, Brenda, for having me. Um, you know, hi, everyone who's listening. I'm Kelsey, the CEO of Class Creatives. We are a PR and social media company, and we really specialize in elevating the voices of thought leaders um, as industry experts. My background is actually in journalism, and I was previously a magazine editor for um, different national publications. And what originally made me fall in love with journalism was that opportunity to tell a story that has never been told before and to educate an audience. So that's really the approach that we take with our PR and social media and what we've seen to be most effective. 
That's awesome. Well, I, and I, I'm not even sure how we stumbled upon each other. If I found you or, or you found me, do you, do you remember? Offhand? I don't remember. <laughs> I think I just saw your amazing content on LinkedIn and I was like, this oh. is very helpful. So I started following along and I thought, you know, I'm just going to drop her a note and say hi. So I'm, I'm oh. so glad that turned into this conversation. Oh. today. And, and you're on the Pacific coast. Is that right? So it's, I am. Yes. So it's like, I mean, we're like here in Metro Detroit, it's like 9, 10 AM. So you're at like 6, 10 AM, which I feel even, even more bad. I'm like, I should have had my act together and been on this morning. No. Except for the last. I'm like, Kelsey woke up at the crack of like probably five o'clock to start getting ready for this. And I just want to thank you so Best much. Best way to for, start the day. Yeah. Well, I'm working with and, and I think you said you were an early riser anyway. So Hopefully this, oh. is, this is okay for you. <laughs> Absolutely. Awesome. That's the thing about being on the West Coast. You kind of start a little earlier to catch everyone on the East Coast and then yeah, maybe that's a, good a little, point. little earlier. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're going to jump in here and we're going to be talking today about three tips for securing high impact PR for your business. One thing I didn't do in the pre-show is let you know I'm going to change our view. And sometimes when I do this, my guests are like, whoa, what just happened? And I need to readjust myself <laughs> in the frame. <laughs> So I'll let you know, we're going to go tight now. It's kind of like in the TV newsroom, they zoom in on Katie Couric as she's talking to the guests, right? I'm, I'm, I'm not the Katie Couric, obviously. Katie was probably much more smooth when she had tech hiccups. <laughs> but at any rate, um, Kelsey, you have some tips for us on securing high impact PR for your business. So what advice do you have for us? Definitely. You know, I think that PR offers such an exciting opportunity for business owners. And I'll start by saying the tips that I'm going to share today, you don't need to go out and necessarily hire a PR company for. You can start by doing these on your own with the budget that you have and th th they'll be actionable in that way. So let's start with um, my first tip. That's creating educational content. Um, and what I mean by educational content is serviceable content that can really benefit an audience. I think when you're thinking about pitching to journalists, it's very easy to get into that mindset of, I need to sell my product. I need to sell my mm -hmm. service and really um, aim for that, that feature on my company or, or aim for my product to be featured in a list of similar products, which I know is, is intuitive, mm -hmm. but just putting ourselves in, in the shoes of journalists, you know, having been there myself, when a journalist is writing a story and they're on deadline, 90% of the time, they don't need products and they don't need services. They need expert sources. They need, mm -hmm. um, you know, experts to quote in their articles, usually about two to three per article. And that's really the biggest stressor is, am I going to source enough experts in time to meet this deadline? Um, you know, and then what can they contribute to this story? Are they going to be helpful for my audience? And even if a journalist is writing a more, let's say, product-based article, mm -hmm. a lot of times they've been handed a list of affiliates, affiliate stores from their publisher that they need to choose products from. And that's so that the publisher gets a cut of those sales, which makes perfect sense. It's just affiliate marketing, but they have no problem finding the products. But 90% of the pitches that they receive are very salesy. It's, hey, here's this product, here's this service. Um, so I would encourage you to really lead with, here's how I can help a journalist complete their story. And that's by offering your expertise in your industry. A lot of times when we start working with clients who haven't worked with a PR company before, the big question is, I don't, is my expertise really worthy of, of national media attention? Like, do people really want to hear from me? And mm -hmm. yes, they do. You are an expert in your industry and we all have those niches that we specialize in. So it's a matter of tapping into that and determining here's the valuable information I have to share and when you reach out to a journalist or a publication to pitch your expertise, mm -hmm. think about a few different ways you can frame it. You know, here are three to five topics I can talk about. Here are three to five things that might be of interest to your audience that I can share quotes on. Maybe add that you're great at quick turnaround quotes in case they need <laughs> expert right. quotes within 24 hours. That's very helpful. Um, and then one thing that you can do too is sign up for helpareporter.com. This is a free platform and mm -hmm. journalists use it to submit queries for expert sources. So there's all different industries and all different publications on helpareporter.com. As a journalist, I used this um, you know, quite liberally and so did other uh, journalists, especially when they were on a tight deadline. You'll see mm -hmm. New York Times reporters there, HuffPost, Bustle, 
wide variety of publications. And they'll say, hey, I'm looking for an expert in this area, or I'm looking for um, a quote about this topic. And then what you're able to do is actually reach out to them directly and pitch them your expertise. And that's a great way to get your foot in the door and start establishing those relationships with journalists. Mm -hmm. and, and I've heard of a uh, helper reporter, and I just put the link below. It, it, and sometimes you'll see the acronym H-A-R-O, help a, yes. is that H-A-R-O? Yeah. I think that's helperreporterout.com. Um, yeah. And I've I've seen it before, and I even have sometimes friends will like send me a story that be like, hey, they're looking for an expert on social media yeah. or marketing, and I'm thinking today like, are they looking for any experts on what to do when your tech fails? Because I'm feeling like I'm in that seat right <laughs> But so um, I, I, yeah, hey, why not? You know what happens when you're not a tech <laughs> expert and your tech kind of like takes a little yeah. hiccup on you in the middle of things, but. <laughs> the help a reporter out, they send like, don't they send like a daily email of like, here's the topics yes. and experts we're looking for to or, or how does that work, work with that process? They do. You can sign up for the specific industries that you want to see queries from, and they'll send it morning, afternoon, and night on business mm -hmm. days. Now that is a lot. So I, I would encourage you not to spend all of your time pitching to helperreporter.com because these reporters do receive a lot of responses, um, especially mm -hmm. if it's a more general topic. So really submit responses. Um, my advice would be to submit responses to the queries that are most specific to your expertise. So um, when you see that that query that's like, wow, okay, I, I really, really could offer insight on this. Those are the ones to pitch to. And you can keep it short. They're honestly probably skinning these very quickly anyway. Um, but yeah. offer your credentials, your quotes, um, you know, your what you can offer. And that can be a great way to make those connections. I get a question too, because sometimes I've submitted things like they'll say that we're looking for experts on this topic and here's what we need. And I'll submit it. I'm like, this is really good information. And, and when you talk about, you know, your tip number one was create educational content. And then I either, it, I usually don't hear back from them at all. And I'm assuming that means they went with others because there's so many inquiries they're receiving. But then I'm thinking, Kelsey, like, I'm going to use this in a LinkedIn post because this is a question, exactly. right? I mean, is that okay to do? Is that is that ethical? Because it's it was their topic originally. They didn't use my response, but it's my expertise that I'm sharing. What do you think about that? Yeah, that's a great question. I would say... So actually two thoughts on this. One, mm -hmm. sometimes I do see journalists put a lot of questions, um, you know, in those helperreporter.com um, mm -hmm. submissions. And it's like, here's 10 questions to answer. I actually recommend reaching out first and giving your credentials and seeing what your expertise is and seeing if they want you to submit quotes, because it's a lot of time and energy to create answers yeah. to all of those questions sometimes. And sometimes they won't have time to, um, you know, get back to you and go through that process. But I feel like the really high value stories, they will take time to interview you and get mm -hmm. on the phone with you and, and talk to you, or at least have that exchange over um, email. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, I, that's, that's one thing you can do to make sure that you're not submitting a lot of material that just doesn't get used. And then you don't know what to do mm -hmm. with it. Um, you could possibly put, um, you know, just a little sentence in those submissions that says, um, you know, please let me know if you'll uh, use this information. Um, you know, this is an exclusive quote for XYZ mm -hmm. publication until yeah. this date. And then after this date, um, if I don't hear from you, I may repurpose it for other. Okay, uses. that's a fair thing to say, you know, I'm giving you kind of first rights of, of refusal. And if you don't yeah. use it, I may be using it. I like that. So that I, I, I and I use the word ethical. I'm like, I'm not like stealing their content, but I'm, I created something in response to their question. And it's my knowledge, like so I can share it. But I think you know, give them an expiration date. I like that. That's a good tip on there. Yeah. yeah. Especially because those, um, the, the email addresses for those helperreporter.com submissions, um, they kind of cover the journalist's, um, email with a different email and that expires. So mm -hmm. after a certain amount of time, if you don't have PR soft software, um, like muckrack or whatever it might be, you can't get, get in touch with them again. Okay. That's true too. Yeah. Cause they are, they're like a veiled email, like a coded thing. It yeah. doesn't say like Kelsey at ABC.com. It's more <laughs> right. like, Coded kind of a thing. That's a good point on there too. Awesome. All right. So, so we've covered one tip already, which was creating educational content. Um, and we're going to keep on going. If you're just joining us here today, we're talking about three tips for securing high impact PR for, for your business. And I think these tips are things that could be any size business from a solopreneur mm -hmm. all the way up to fortune 500. Is that fair to say? 
Absolutely. These are, uh, you know, tips that really apply to anyone uh, who wants to earn that media coverage. Um, and that actually leads me to my second um, tip, which is get clear on your credentials. Um, you know, and you can get clear on your credentials, whether you are, you know, that individual entrepreneur or the CEO of a big company. Um, but just as a little bit of background, when journalists are writing an article, what they're looking for is how can I show my editor that I've really gotten good sources for this story? Mm -hmm. And the bigger the publication, um, the more, uh, you know, credible, the more credentials they'll be looking for. Now, credentials can come in the form of, uh, you know, licenses or other credentials like MD, CPA. We have a client who is a CCWS, which is a Certified Corporate Wellness Specialist. Oh, uh, so okay. if you have anything like that, make sure that you're including it in your title to show that you are an expert in your industry because you are. And you've done the homework. You, you know this industry so well. But even if you don't have something like that, what you can do is talk about your accomplishments or who's trusted you. So let's mm -hmm. say um, you're a speaker. Even if you don't have a license as a speaker, you can say, um, you know, I'm a speaker who has been trusted by X, Y, and Z companies. Maybe you've spoken okay. for corporate companies or other organizations. Or if you're an author, um, you an author who has sold X number of books or written X number of books on this topic. Those okay. are all little things that show how integrated you are in your industry and that you have the experience to back up your knowledge. I like that. And that that kind of hit, and I want to say struck a nerve with me, but kind of resonated with me because I'm, I'm no longer a corporate employee. And I sometimes see even like boards will choose corporate employees to sit on their boards like the I'm going to use the chairman of or the president of ABC or the head of PepsiCo or whatever. And Meller Marketing is, you know, it's an amazing company. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, but absolutely. I don't know that it has the worldwide notoriety that some of those organizations do. So you've just given me and, and perhaps our, our listeners and viewers some ideas, too, on how to credential yourself. Yes, I have an MBA. I have that. And I, I'm I went through Toastmasters International. So I have some speaking certifications there. Amazing. I could say national speaker because i've done some national speaking engagements and i can reference some conferences or even some client names it sounds like is that what you're saying yes exactly because what mm -hmm. they're looking for is who has trusted this individual and if they see that these companies have trusted you then they'll say oh okay well then i can trust this individual or our audiences can trust this expert and um, so that's a great way to go I like that. And using using what you have, you know, kind of do an inventory. Where have I spoken already? You can talk about some of the different media outlets or sites that you've appeared on. Um, what about name dropping podcasts? If they're if they're popular mm -hmm. podcasts, could I could you say that you're a frequent podcast guest on shows yes. such as X, Y and Z? Is that helpful? Exactly. Showing where else you've been showcased as an expert is fantastic, especially if you're looking to get on other podcasts as a PR opportunity and, um, you know, podcast hosts always want to see your previous experience. So just bringing that to the table, but even if it is for more traditional, you know, print digital publications, even broadcast showing that, you know, how to speak and how to conduct an interview is, is great because that's something that they're looking for too. Um, can this person give short pithy quotes that I can add to an article or that I can excerpt? You know, if someone goes on for a while or doesn't really know yeah. how to um, make information concise, it can be more difficult to extract their expertise for a piece. I love it. And even I want to just kind of I, I pull the curtain back sometimes when we're doing these interviews and let the audience know. I'm, I'm more like, hey, if there's a tech thing that happens, I let people know. And I think sometimes there's things that happen behind the scenes and as we prepare for the show that may help other people as well. So when we first booked this and we were talking about the topic, and I said, why don't you do like, let's do like three to five things, like pick something. Don't just say tips for securing high impact PR for your business. Cause I feel like sometimes the conversations meander and if we can get like three solid points in there. So you came up with the three tips and in mm -hmm. the pre-show, I went through my flow, you know, how the, the show will go. And you said, okay, so, and I, to, I said, I'll introduce you and I'll give you like a wide open question. So what tips do you have for us? You know? And then you, you had asked, uh, do I pause in between to allow you for Q and A? And I can tell, I mean, you're, you're a great interview guest because you get that this is, this is not just a one way, like how much mic time can Kelsey get today? It's more, we want this to feel conversational. We want this to feel natural, but I think also having the conversation go from you to me, it, it creates a little bit of white space 
Because then people can process, you know, what she just said. So Kelsey already gave us one tip, create educational content. She gave us another tip, getting clear on your credentials. And I'm even like right now, I'm kind of repeating it back. And I think it helps to reinforce the point. But I think that's a really good point. The reporters want somebody who understands. It's almost like the um, the flow of the interview. Like mm-hmm. it's got to have a little bit of me, a little bit of you. You have to pick up on the cues. Is that fair to say? It's it's absolutely fair. And the journalist has very likely already written out a, a series of questions to ask mm-hmm. their expert. So sometimes what can happen is they ask that first question and then the answer goes on for so long that they feel like they can't jump in or they can't finish their questions. And yeah. to be a great interview guest, you want to give concise answers to your point so that they can then you know, ask their next question. And it does have that back and forth and it's a conversation. So absolutely, you, you hit the nail on the head. Yeah, and I mentioned Toastmasters earlier. I'm gonna cue back to that again because there's something we do in Toastmasters they're called table topics, which is someone will ask a question and you have to give a response of one to two minutes. And there's a timer that holds up light so you can see how long you've been speaking, but you learn to understand like, what does a minute feel like? Cause your goal is to speak to, to at least one minute, but no longer than two. And I right. think it's the same thing in an interview, right? You should strive to speak for a, a small amount of time and then almost like volley it over to the other person, would you say? Exactly. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And it's it's easy to to talk for a while if you're one nervous or you just have a lot to say um, on the topic. So I completely understand that. Um, but, you, you know, the more you do interviews, the more naturally that comes as well. Good. Oh, awesome. So so tip number two, again, was getting clear on your credentials. And I'm seeing like I could see and I want to our audience as you're watching in right now, whether you're watching in live or playback. Give us some examples of credentials. This is this is probably prompting some ideas for you. You know, Kelsey was talking about certifications. Sometimes it's the acronyms, the MBA, the CPA. Uh, other times it might be the types of organizations. So you might name drop some of the large organizations that you've worked mm-hmm. with or, or, or other credentials like that. But I want to invite our audience, drop in comments. Give it, Let's give each other ideas. Let's do a little bit of brainstorming as we go along. And I'll, I'll turn the floor back over to you again, Kelsey. Yeah, so third tip is finding your news hook. Uh, so just going back to journalism 101 here, when journalists are writing what's called a nut graph, that is the paragraph that is really the heart of the story. It answers the questions, who, what, when, where, why, and how. And they have to answer those questions at the top of their article to make it relevant. But often when they receive pitches, that when part is missing. And that's the news hook. That's the reason why they're writing the story right now. Now, granted, there are more evergreen stories that can be Mm -hmm. read or written at any time of the year. But often, um, you know, let's just say in the digital space, those are those are created more for SEO. And so they're targeting certain keywords. And that's the reason those evergreen pieces are being Mm -hmm. created. Um, And there's also opportunities for that in broadcast and and other media as well. But it's even more compelling if you can have a news hook in your PR pitch. Um, So in order to think about this, I know the first thing that might come to mind are your own company announcements or news, you know, hey, I'm, um, you know, I'm launching this new program, or I'm going to be speaking at this event, or this new book is coming out. Mm -hmm. But you can also go beyond that, Uh, you know, think about seasonality, for instance, how Mm -hmm. can your expertise tie into the time of year, uh, whether it's summer or the holidays. Uh, For instance, if you're just using an example, generally, if you're a baking expert, um, you know, in the summer, think about uh, recipes for no bake cookies, because it's hot Mm -hmm. and people don't want to be in their kitchens with the oven on, they want something cool and quick to make. That's something that you can think about. Um, Or, you know, Skincare. Um, I, I know that these might be a little different, but just for the sake of it, you know, yeah, example, yeah. mm-hmm. um, you know, skincare. How can you uh, combat humidity in the summer, or what do you really need to pack in your uh, carry-on and that tiny little Ziploc bag that you have um, to take on the airplane with you? You know, anything that ties into the season can be a great hook for your pitches and mm-hmm. um, for your expertise. And then also, okay. rel- oh, sorry, go ahead. No, that's okay. Go go ahead. Finish your point. Yeah. I I was going to say also, you know, relevancy and trends. So with Mm -hmm. relevancy, is there something going on in the news? Are there headlines Mm -hmm. that you can add your expertise to? Maybe Mm -hmm. there's, um, 
you know, a news piece that you want to add a little bit of insight to as an expert, that can be very helpful. Um, or even is there something, um, is there an issue that your company is helping with by, um, you know, maybe giving a, proceed, a portion of your sales to a certain local organization to help with an issue? That's relevancy. And then with trends, um, because you are the expert in your industry, you know it better than, than you know, people outside of your industry. So you mm -hmm. know the trends that are happening and you can touch on those to provide qualitative evidence for journalists. So let's say you're a coffee shop owner and you notice that requests for licorice flavored lattes have gone up in the last three months. Right. You, yeah, you you know you can say, hey, we've noticed. Is that a thing? Licorice flavor flavor lattes. I, I, you know, I bring that up because I just saw it at a cafe the other day. And I, I I've seen lavender lattes, but I've not <laughs> seen licorice. But I'll have to be on my on the lookout for that. Hmm. Absolutely, I, I know. I want to try it the next time I'm back at that cafe. But you know, licorice <laughs> lattes, lavender lattes, whatever it might be. If you notice that there's an uptick in requests, or maybe you're a coach and you see that there's an uptick in certain. Um, issues that, that people are facing and coming to you about, you can mm -hmm. use that qualitative evidence to, you know, pinpoint that trend for journalists and maybe provide insight on where that trend came from, where it's originating from, and where it's going from here. And that's very valuable to a journalist because they want to be on top of the trends and they want to be mm -hmm. the first to cover them. And if they have mm -hmm. expert insight explaining the trend on top of it, even better. I love it. So I want to go back to a previous point, and then I want to come back to this with something. Yeah. So earlier when you were talking about baked goods, all of my listeners and viewers that know me know that I love pie. And they're like, is she going to talk about pie? Of course, I'm going to say something about pie because pie is like my favorite. I was like, anytime people talk about, and I was thinking I have like, I have like a little mini pie that somebody got me from Etsy, but I don't think it's behind <laughs> me right now. It, it's, I'll have to find it later. But um, the other thing you were talking about is like finding something on trend and, yeah. and, and, I mean, sometimes we're using sites like help a reporter out to respond to a specific inquiry. Other times we're pitching reporters on an idea of trends. Yeah. And one thing that you were just referencing about, you know, the, the, the lavender latte and the licorice lattes and things like that. So within our community, if you're a coach, consultant, speaker, or author, you talk to people, you talk to other coaches, you talk to other speakers, that type of thing. And I was on a round table recently with um, Laura Khalil. I'll give her a shout out and I'll tag her in comments. She has this really great monthly round table where we come together and it's really, she's a facilitating the discussion, but it's a discussion with all of us. It's not just Laura talking. And she was talking like, what trends are we experiencing? What things are happening? And she, she mentioned, she's noticing that some of her clients, and I, and I think it might be due to the economy. We're not mm -hmm. quite sure what's happening. We're not quite sure what's coming next. Is it a recession? Is it not a recession? Are we on the brink of a recession? Are we not? Like, are we just going to push through? Are we done with the pandemic? Are we not? But people seem to be taking longer to make buying decisions now. Yeah. Um, for both her and I, you know, our corporate clients, whether it's it's engaging with me for LinkedIn coaching or booking me for training, they're a little bit more hesitant. And she's like, I feel like they need more handholding. They need more conversations before signing up. And I'm like, yeah, I, I noticed that too. And it was like, if we hadn't talked about that, you know, we, we might've been like, it's just me, you know, but now, okay. now we both see it as a trend that's impacting those of us who are self-employed. It's not just impacting the big companies. It's okay. like the economic trickle down effect that happens when people aren't sure about their economic future or, or about the economic climate here in the U S yeah. So is that an idea? I mean, is that something we could, uh, you know, reach out and say, hey, these are, we've observed this. Um, 100%. That's that, right? Yeah. You know, I, I even think that reaching out to a business publication, you know, a B2B publication saying, hey, we're noticing that the nurturing phase of the marketing funnel is growing and growing before we can get them to yep. conversion. Um, you know, here is what we're noticing. And here are our three top tips for business owners. So mm -hmm. not only identifying the trend, but then providing some service, going back to that educational aspect so that mm -hmm. you can kind of pose the challenge and then also the solution. I like that. And, and, and it creates a really nice story for the reporter if they choose yeah. to pick it up. If not, I've got a blog or I've got a exactly. video or I've got a conversation with Laura that I can do on my podcast uh, amongst right. the same thing. And I love, like, here's the problem and here's the solution. I like that. 100%. 100%. 
And to the point about your own blog and social media too, even creating that content yourself, journalists will come across that because they're also on social media. They're Googling experts on these topics. So creating your own content is a great way to get the word out to kind of more inbound PR. Yeah. yeah. I love it. Well, such great tips. I, we're going to change gears a little bit. I want to invite our audience into this discussion right now here. And we're here today talking about three tips for securing high impact PR for your business. And Kelsey has given us three tips so far. And if you're joining us a bit late, I'm just going to run through them again. I hopefully got these correct here for, for us, Kelsey. Tip one was creating educational content, right? Mm -hmm. Tip number two was getting clear on your credentials. Love that, by the way. And tip, oops, I put tip, but not tip three, but it is tip three, finding the news book, right? <laughs> Yeah. All right. So, so don't be shy. If you're watching us, whether you're watching this live or in playback, drop a comment or a question below and we'll pull you up on screen here. And I see a, a few comments that are coming in. Meryl. Hey, Meryl, how are you doing? Meryl says he first heard about help a reporter out from LinkedIn rock star Kenneth Lang. Thank you, Meryl, for that mention. And Andrew Miller, um, I'm not sure, if Andrew, if maybe you work in marketing or PR too, but Andrew's saying, remember the audience. It's not about you. Here's what you're doing to help them and their readers, viewers, listeners. Do you want to add to that, Kelsey? Because I think like this is an important point here. Exactly. And that's where it goes back to the educational content. You're not selling yourself. You're providing something of value to the mm -hmm. audience. Um, and to that point too, when you're pitching, it's not about you landing coverage. It's about helping the journalist. A lot of times, a lot of times journalists will get comments like, please give me your feedback, get back to me right away. And it's almost like giving them homework in addition to their jobs. It's, it's not about either. It's not about the journalist. It's not about the PR. It's about educating the reader or the listener or the viewer. Um, and as long as you keep that as your North Star, you'll have successful content. And I feel like people trip up over that because when you hear like, I want to get, you know, high impact PR from a business, I want to be on the front page of XYZ publication or this website yeah. because it will drive more sales for me. So they, they tend to back into their pitch and going back to your earlier point, we have a new product, we have a new service, and this is why it's newsworthy. I remember back in my corporate days when people do that all the time and I'd be like, okay, it's newsworthy for you. Like exactly. we care about it here because it's a big deal because you just launched a product, but why the, the with them, the what's in it for them. I think that's, that's what yeah. we're really getting to. Right. Definitely. And, you know, even a journalist, they can't feature your product or your service mm -hmm. just to be nice or to do you a favor. There's a saying in journalism that your only true boss is the public. If you're truly being an ethical journalist, you are putting the public and your audience first and foremost. And that's most important. I've been told when I was a journalist, even more important than your editor, the public is your boss. Like they're the ones that you have to benefit. Um, and that's really what it comes down to. Yeah, that's a good point. The audience is your your end user, so to speak, your customer. Um, and it's, it's I, I, I like the the term with them, but I think redirecting everything back to what's the value for them. Um, and I think if you use that as an approach, you'll probably, I would think, be more successful in your pitches to, to work with the media. Is that fair to say, Kelsey? Exactly, exactly. And even, you know, when you do position yourself as an expert, that audience trusts you more and that's what's going to lead to sales anyhow. So it's just part of that funnel and you'll get to the sales point, but first you do need to be that trusted expert. I'm trying to toggle back and forth. I got my, finally got my second screen up over here and I can kind of see what's happening in the audience. <laughs> but it's a little bit when you're hosting these events, uh, it's, it's, I, you know, there's multiple audiences. And even like when you think about PR, PR has multiple audiences too. It's ultimately about the end user, the reader, the consumer, right? Yeah. And what's relevant for them. But then you're also pitching it to the the reporter, right? And then yeah. the reporter has to, you know, run it up the flagpole to their editor and get the approval for it. So you have to like be thinking of different <laughs> audiences there. Similarly, on a LinkedIn Live, I've got Kelsey, who's my VIP guest for today. I've got my live audience that's watching with you with us like we're live right now. We've got our playback audience. And then later on, we'll have a podcast uh, on our audience as well. So I've even like tried to change up some of the things that I'm doing. So when I'm demonstrating things on screen, I'm I'm describing them. 
because if you're listening, you can't see that I'm indicating things like, and even little things like, I don't know if, if those of you who watch my show regularly can tell, like my video quality is not quite as crisp because I'm on a different laptop for today. So there's little nuances mm -hmm. that go along with it. So, um, so David, David Ball from joining us from Texas. Hey, David, how are you? Nice to see you. David says, uh, he has a question. He says, just because I have expertise doesn't mean the journalists will use me. That's a really mm -hmm. good, good point. So Kelsey, what are your thoughts on, you know, how do you build trust with them first? What are your thoughts for David there? Right. So going back to your credentials and what experience and expertise you do have, who's trusted you, what are your accomplishments? Um, you know, just to use an example, if you're a content marketer, you've mm -hmm. driven X, you know, dollars in revenue for a company, show them your accomplishments. And it's okay if you don't um, get accepted upon your first pitch, nurture that relationship anyway. If um, if you want, maybe add the journalist um, on LinkedIn, stay in touch with them, comment on their posts, build that organic relationship so that they know you're there when the opportunity comes up. Because I think that there's this, this idea that journalists get approached with pitches and then they decide to write a story. But usually what happens is they're going to Monday pitch meetings with their team, they're pitching ideas that get approved and then they have their list of ideas and they're just matching experts to them. So yeah. if you're there supporting them and building that relationship with them, um, interacting with their content, maybe dropping a note when you like their article, if they um, you know, write about a, a topic that you're an expert in, Build that relationship in the meantime so that when a piece comes along that they do need an expert for, that you're the perfect fit for, they think of you top of mind. That's a great tip. And I'm curious, Kelsey, what your thoughts are on which social media platform is best to connect and engage with reporters or with media outlets. I, I used to find it was more Twitter. Um, and yeah. Twitter's a little bit of a, a mess, so to speak, right now over there. And some people are leaving Twitter. Yeah. And I don't see as many reporters and media outlets using LinkedIn. So I'm curious mm -hmm. if you have, you know, as social media is evolving and as even as the media landscape is changing and evolving, what's the best way to try to connect with them online through social media? Is it Twitter? Is it Facebook? Is it LinkedIn? Or do you yeah. have to kind of like figure out where they are active? It's a great question. I and it, it might be a little different for every um, every journalist. I would start with the platforms that you personally feel most comfortable on and where you have the most content, so that when they connect with you there, they see that you're an active expert. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that said, I think Instagram is great. Um, a lot of you know journalists or editors have more public facing Instagrams where they'll share their work or maybe events that they mm -hmm. go to. Um, when I was working for magazines, I, different PR contacts would follow me on Instagram and kind of cheer on little different moments in my life. And that was just a, a nice way to connect as well. But, uh, you know, mm -hmm. if LinkedIn is where you are most active, then that's perfectly fine, too. I've connected with journalists yeah. on LinkedIn, and sometimes it's um, much easier to kind of have that connection than just what another email in their inbox because they see your profile, they see your picture, they see your background. And mm -hmm. it's just, you know, if, or if you create a lot of content, they see your expertise. Um, so it's just one more touch point. And if they're active there and you're active there, then it's a great place to meet. I like that. And I think you can, you can be a fan of them and show your support and build up social media karma and build up yeah. familiarity, going back to that point, David, of how do you build trust um, can be an important thing. Yeah. Uh, related to this, I see another question. This is from Wendy. Hey, Wendy, thanks for watching today. And Wendy is asking you, Kelsey, how do you stay up to date with the latest trends and changes in PR and social media? And how do you incorporate these into your strategies? It's something that Wendy is still trying to find a balance in. What are your thoughts there? Definitely. Um, so I'm a huge fan of signing up for any industry newsletter that you can and just diving in in the morning. I have um, a bunch of different resources that come to my inbox that I like to share with my team. Um, you know, when when we're exploring different trends, also keeping an eye on what other companies are doing and, you know, staying on top of industry news just via various websites. Um, for instance, there's some changes in Instagram right now where hashtags are going more towards Towards keywords and and that's something to keep an eye on. Um, but you know, I think that at the core of it, there will be trends in um, social media 
algorithms, there will be trends in PR, but when it comes to PR, the most important thing is just to have a genuinely good story and genuinely good expertise, because no matter what the trends are, that's the only thing that journalists are going to be looking for at the end of the day is a great source for their story to educate their audience. So as long as you stick to that, um, you know, I, I don't think that you have to worry as much about the shifting landscapes, um, you know, in PR. There might be a few things that you want to think about. For instance, there's traditional broadcast opportunities, and then there's also the shift to, um, you know, collaborating with YouTube influencers, which is kind of like a new form yeah. of broadcast opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, so it's good to keep an eye out for those things so that you know which opportunities to go after. But the pitching mm -hmm. is still the same. You're still bringing a great story to the table and great expertise to the table. I like that. And I know you, you mentioned industry newsletters. Are there any within the PR category? Like I remember back in my day when I worked in marketing and in corporate, there was like Ad Age and um, yeah. American Marketing Association and things like that. In the PR world, are there PR publications or newsletters that you would recommend? Yeah, you know, a lot of the newsletters that I subscribe to are kind of more marketing in general. So I can see the big picture because a lot of times PR is one pillar, but then it's combined with social media and maybe your paid mm -hmm. ad strategy. So, so I always like to look at the whole ecosystem. I really like um, Marketing Brew. That's that's a good one. Um, just Marketing for Brew. Oh, that's right. That's with... Uh, they have like the morning brew and then they've got the marketing brew and the tech yes. brew. They've got like the different iterations. I'm going to give a shout out to them in the comments here because I think that is a good one. Yeah. Yeah. They have great info and they really look at the industry as a whole, which I like. I learn a lot about different, you know, areas of marketing. And um, our whole team has really found that to be um, a, a good one. Sometimes they'll ping over articles that they see in there and I'll do the same. And um, it's always really insightful. Okay. I'm trying to find it. I think maybe morning brew has a page on LinkedIn. And if anyone else can find it and drop it into comments, feel free, but I'm seeing morning brew, but I don't think marketing brew has its own page. So you'll have to go up to morning brew, go to their website, and then you can come back, back down into marketing brew on there. But that's a great resource. I do like that one as a tip on here. So um, I'm going to start to wrap us up here for today. But as we do so, Kelsey, I'm going to pull up your LinkedIn URL up on screen. And I'm also going to share your profile here. Give me just a second. So there's your URL. I'm sharing that on screen. And then I'm also going to share your profile. So for those folks that visit, they can see which profile we're referring to here. And here we go. Kelsey Klaas on LinkedIn. There she is. And Kelsey, are you open to connecting with folks that are either listening to the show live or in playback later? Absolutely. Please connect. I would love to chat with you more, even if it's just brainstorming and talking about your business and, and what your goals are right now. Um, these things are fun to chat about and to brainstorm together. So let's definitely connect. All right. And I see, Kelsey, because you have the, the hashtags on your profile, that means that you have turned on creator mode. So I'm going to let people know if they're if they're watching, listening, uh, they're coming to your profile. The blue button is going to say follow. That's going to be the default button on Kelsey's profile. If you want to connect with Kelsey, you can, but you've got to go under the more button. Or if you're coming through on the mobile app, it might be three dots. And then underneath that, when you click on the more or the three dots, you'll see a menu, one of which will either say personalize, invite, or connect. It'll be the one, either one or the other. Choose that. And then you'll get an option to add a note. And just mention that you saw her. Just say, hey, I saw you on the interview with Brenda Muller. Like name drop me in there because um, Kelsey and I don't do a lot of these interviews together. This is like the first time we've done one, but then she'll know like where you came from. Is that, is that, would that be helpful for you, Kelsey, too, knowing where they that came from? That would be great. Show? Yeah, absolutely. All right. Awesome. And then as we are winding down our conversation, I also want to pull up your website up on screen for folks that might be interested in visiting your website. And while I do that, can you tell us a little bit about what are the products and services that you offer? If people are interested in doing business with you, like, let us know, what do you do? Definitely. So Class Creatives focuses on PR and social media and also content marketing. We really focus on thought leaders and those who want to scale as experts in their industry. So when it comes to social media in particular, we focus on Instagram and LinkedIn. We find those to be amazing platforms for thought leaders. So that's where we put um, our time and energy. And um, also, of course, like I mentioned, PR and content. That's awesome. Well, and you work with, do you work with solopreneurs, coaches, consultants, speakers, authors, or do you work mainly with small to mid-sized companies or who do you work with mainly? 
We work with a variety of clients. Some are larger companies, some are solopreneurs or, uh, you know, single thought leaders in their industry. So um, it's a variety. Okay, good to know. And I'm going to grab, since I know you're heavy on Insta, I got to grab a quick picture of my screen right now. I'm going to put this on Instagram later and I'll tag you in on there. Sometimes I have to like, I have to remember because I'll get down, I'll be like, oh, I didn't grab a picture. And I could certainly go into LinkedIn and grab a screen capture there, but I like grabbing it live and then I'll, I'll showcase that a little bit later. But I, I'm, te- I'm telling my audience too, because I'm always pulling back the curtain and I'm like, you got to remember to do these things. And sometimes you can do like, you can pull your phone up and do like this without like people noticing that you're doing it. Other times it's like, okay, I'm taking a picture of you. Yes. <laughs> you gotta call it out. Right here. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. At any rate, um, this has been just such a delightful conversation here today, Kelsey. And as we wrap up, any final comments for folks on securing high impact PR for their business? Yeah, my final note would just be believe that you truly are an expert in your industry. Um, you know, we had a, a brand new client who uh, we had a conversation with who said, I'm not really sure. I, am I am I worthy of this PR? And we said, yes, you are. Within a month, she's been interviewed by the New York Times. Well and good. She's doing amazing. You you 100 percent got this, especially, you know, if you tell the right story. I love it. And in my show, I call this enthusiastically self-employed, Kelsey, and I can tell that you are enthusiastically self-employed and you can help others on that path as well. So such a delightful conversation. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for getting up so early for us this morning. I really do appreciate it. This is great. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. And I want to just kind of give a shout out to our audience, whether you're watching this live or in playback, as soon as you're done watching the video or listening to the podcast, could you do us a favor? Could you share it along? And let's say you're on LinkedIn and you're looking to share it along. When you click on share, you can share it as a post with your thoughts. If you do so, tag Kelsey and I in your post and you use a little at sign before our names to tag us. And when you use that tag sign, that at sign, I should say rather, Kelsey and I will get a notification that you've talked about us in the post. We'll jump in and we'll add a comment, which helps to jumpstart engagement for you. And by the way, this is a really great technique if you're struggling with coming up with content ideas. It's a really great way of getting your name out into the homepage feed. And, and to Kelsey's earlier point, and she was even talking about tip number one, creating educational content. You could create educational content with this post. You can share it along and tell people something that you learned by watching this, whether it was help a reporter out or keeping the focus in mind, not being overly salesy, anything that you're walking away with tips, you could share it along and you could encourage others in your network. You never know who you're going to help with that technique. So give that a try. So thank you again for watching, everyone. Thank you, Kelsey. I hope we have the chance to meet in in person, but maybe I can have you back on for another topic sometime later in the year. I would love that. Yeah. All right. Everyone stay safe and stay healthy. We look forward to seeing you on LinkedIn. Have a great rest of your day. And a reminder, I'll be here every Tuesday-ish. I might be a little bit lighter in the summer, but Tuesday at 9.05, check me out here on LinkedIn. Take care, everyone. Thank you.